gael o'r aelodau i drefn yr eitem cyntaf prynawn yma yw cwestiynau i'r prif weinidog a'r cwestiwn cyntaf gan David Rowlands. Uh, Diolch Llewydd. Uh, how does the First Minister assess progress in delivering the commitments to economic development set out in the programme for government? Well, the Economic Action Plan sets out our approach to building a strong economy through future-proofing businesses and empowering our places and people to become more productive. Uh, one of the recommendations in the Economy, Infrastructure and Skills Committee report on city deals and the regional economies of Wales stated there is a real danger that crea the creation of regional boards and the structures to support them add an additional level of bureaucracy to economic development in Wales. We now understand that North Wales, South West and Mid Wales and uh, South Wales East Region will have a regional officer to overlook the city and growth deals. Could the First Minister give an indication as to how these appointments are progressing and also outline what he feels will be their full remit? I understand that uh, the three are in place now. He asked the question about uh, the structure. Well, where you have a regional deal, there needs to be a regional structure to deliver that deal. You can't rely on individual local authorities to do it working by themselves, but by working together and with other levels of government, they can deliver the best outcome for the people who live in that area. Russell George. Uh, John Flyweth. Um, First Minister, the new wave of uh, technological advances in robotics and AI will potentially have a huge impact on jobs. And this is a piece of work that we're currently doing in the Economy and Infrastructure and Skills Committee. Now, I certainly want to see uh, the Welsh economy take full advantage of the opportunities presented by automation. Now, I appreciate that the Welsh Government has appointed Phil Brown to carry out a piece of work in this area, uh, but uh, that's not to say that work can't be ongoing now before he reports. Uh, do you have a lead officer working on this within the Welsh Government? And as this is an area which rightly crosses over a number of portfolios across Cabinet Secretaries, who is the lead Cabinet Secretary in this area? Well, in terms of digital innovation, obviously uh, Julie James has that uh, role. This is more than just about economic development, of course. Uh, people tend to see um, innovation as a threat to jobs. It needn't be. And, of course, we have to understand that uh, there are opportunities there in terms of transforming the way, for example, that the health service works, uh, something that my colleague, the Emperor Tinelli, has, has made uh, very, very clear on a number of occasions. So it's not just an issue of economic development, uh, although it's an important part, of the uh, the future, but it has to it cuts across many many areas of government, and that's why, of course, it needs to be dealt with by somebody with a, a cross government responsibility in that area. Question: Die Neil McAvoy. Yeah, Will the first minister make a statement on the awarding of the Wales and Borders Rail franchise? Yes, uh, presiding officer. I understand you've given your permission for questions two and four to be grouped. Well, members will uh, now be aware of the details of the new rail services contract following the Cabinet Secretary for Economy and Transport's written statement on Monday. OK, Diolk. Before, just before the recess, you announced that the winner of the New Wales and Borders, Borders Rail franchise, um, it's already been pointed out that you uh, have broken a manifesto commitment for a not-for-profit railway company. But it also seems now that you're privatising the infrastructure from the Core Valley lines as well, and that's a real concern after what happened the last time that the Conservatives privatised the, the rail. In particular, we had the, the Hatfield disaster, which led to private companies running rail track being abandoned and the creation of Network Rail as a public body. So what I'd like to know is whether you, or not you've had permission from Network Rail to privatise this infrastructure. And the real question really is, what, why can't it be kept in, in public ownership? And what will happen to the 1,600 people that nail, the Network Rail directly employs in Wales, will your Labour government be transferring these to the private multinational corporations? No, first of all, uh, it's probably right to say that our first preference would have been to have had a not-for-profit public sector uh, organisation or body able to bid for the franchise. That was expressly ruled out by the uh, legislation in, in, in Westminster, something which I didn't uh, welcome, uh, neither now nor at the time. What we have, however, is a service that will be an excellent service. It will improve capacity across the whole of Wales. Everybody will see uh, a positive uh, difference to, uh, to services. Uh, he, he suggests that the network has been privatised. Well, we've talked to the rail unions, to the RMT, personally I've talked to them, to the TSSA, and also to ASLEF. Uh, they understand the, uh, the way forward. 
Uh, we have made sure, for example, there will be a guard on uh, every train to add to uh, passenger uh, security and safety. So we work with the unions in order to deliver a rail network that will be, uh, I believe, will be the envy of the rest of the UK in future years, especially given the chaos that we see existing in some parts of England at the moment. Jane Bryant. This announcement is great news, particularly for many of us who have campaigned uh, for many years for the Ebervale to Cardiff line to stop in Newport. It's gathered a lot of local support, including from the South Wales Argus, who have long campaigned on this issue, and it's a huge boost and will link communities across the region. I welcome the announcement that £800 million will be invested in rolling stock and that the franchise have committed to commissioning 148 brand new trains for the next five years. Yesterday's announcement stated that over half the new trains will be built in Wales. Can you give any further detail about what discussions are taking place with CAF Rail in Newport? Well, the CAF investment is hugely significant. As the member has said, uh, it is a hugely important capital investment. It will create 300 uh, highly skilled jobs in Newport as well. Uh, I can say that the ODP is expected to procure long-distance rolling stock fleet from CAF. That rolling stock will be assembled at the CAF facility in Newport. Of course, the contractual arrangements uh, will be a commercial matter between the ODP and CAF uh, itself. But it's an excellent example uh, of working together in order to deliver jobs in, uh, in Wales. And uh, there's not in my mind the CAF were one of the things that attracted CAF to Wales in the first place was the fact that we have an exciting programme of investment for our railways. Mark Isherwood. Uh, Clive. Well, yesterday's uh, statement by the uh, Economy and Transport Secretary said that we'll see a second limited stop express service every hour on the Wrexham Bidston line from 2021 and from 2022 see services stopping at Wrexham as part of a new two hourly Liverpool to Cardiff service. How therefore do you respond to the statement made to me yesterday by rail user groups in North East Wales that the two trains allocated to the route could be running an earlier service into Wrexham at around 8.30 and operate a more frequent service over the line during the evenings and on Sunday, and that providing train crews can be sourced, this could be realised as early as December 2018 or the May 2019 timetable change. Yes, I mean, these are all part of the discussions on, uh, on timetabling, uh, but the intention, as the members rightly said, is to improve the service on the, uh, the Rex and Bidston line and indeed to utilise the Halton curve, further than that of course, uh, to discuss with Mersey Rail the possibility of using the Mersey Tunnel as well in order for trains to be able to uh, go straight into uh, to Liverpool. Those discussions will take place um, uh, in order to allow that to happen. It's a long held ambition for trains from Wrexham Central to go into, uh, into Liverpool. Uh, but of course uh, the Wrexham Bidston service is amongst the one of the, one of the first uh, candidates for improvement that people will see. We want to see that line develop even further in the future. Gareth Bennett. Oh, uh, Lewis. Um, one of the issues that um, was mentioned yesterday in, in press reports was that um, the payments made to the new franchisee will um, depend to some extent on their delivery of service, which sounds good. Now, the, the, some of the criteria that were um, mentioned included cleanliness, quality of service and punctuality. But one of the problems with the privatised rail services that we've had in the last 20 years is sometimes punctuality, um, the rules can sometimes be avoided by trains being cancelled instead. So I wondered if that, pro uh, if that um, issue had been looked at with the awarding of the contract. No, that can't happen. Uh, we're aware of what happened at uh, Northern Rail. Uh, we've ensured as part of the contract that uh, rail operators cannot get out of their obligations simply by running fewer or no uh, trains. And of course, as part of the announcement, um, there will be arrangements for uh, there will be simplified compensation arrangements for uh, passengers who uh, have to wait as well. So we want to make the service as uh, user-friendly as possible, uh, and it's exciting that the operator wants to do the same. They want to make sure uh, that they work with us in order to build a rail network for the future. It's in the, the days of 40-year-old trains uh, running on the valley lines particularly. Those days are coming to an end, and I'm sure the people of the valleys will be delighted to see that. Jane Hutt. Minister, I welcome the announcements made as a result of the uh, Wales and Board of Rail franchise and South Wales Metro. I particularly welcome the commitment to include half-hourly services to the Vale of Glamorgan line from 2023. I've been campaigning for this for many years, and of course you recall the Welsh Government opened, reopened the stations at Roos and Llantwick Major in 2005. Uh, does the First Minister, uh, do you agree with me that a half-hourly service which calls at Roos uh, station for Cardiff Airport will also improve access to the airport? 
Uh, yes, it will. And I can also say that Transport for Wales, with support from the ODP, will also be procuring a bus service as part of an integrated approach to improving connectivity across the Vale of De Morgan, connecting Barry and the airport, and that will be available no later than the 1st of January 2024. Mark Reckless. Uh, I welcome the uh, new contract and uh, particularly the long overdue uh, new rolling stock for the valleys uh, lines, but also the reduction in fares from the upper valleys, which will help many people uh, give more, more opportunities to commute in and access uh, jobs, particularly in, in Cardiff. Could I just ask the First Minister to say something uh, about the risks that may come from the contract in terms of the, the, the different approach to risk sharing? And if we see um, passenger numbers and fares undershoot relative to expectations, what may be the implications for other uh, government services? We don't anticipate that at all. Uh, the last franchise was let on the basis that there will be no growth in passenger numbers. Uh, there was an enormous growth in passenger numbers, and we see now the overcrowding that takes place on so many uh, services, uh, not just on the Valley Lines, but across many services that run between, on, Wales, on the Wales and the Borders franchise uh, network. Uh, we have built in to, our, uh, our, um, uh, to, to the agreement the expectation that passenger numbers will rise, particularly but not exclusively passengers going through Cardiff Central, uh, and the uh, agreement is based on uh, seeing an increase in passenger numbers. I, I can't see the numbers decreasing. Uh, I can't see that people will want to travel less or, or not travel uh, into uh, work. We must be careful to make sure, of course, that there is sufficient capacity over the next uh, few years uh, that people feel that there is a, a comfortable and good value alternative to the car. But what we can't do is keep on building roads into our cities uh, in the hope that that will resolve the issue of, uh, of, of traffic. It can't be done without demolishing houses. Christian and Argan Arwen were a pleadier. Arwen is group you have Caroline Jones. Dear Llywydd, uh, First Minister, the plans for the New Wales and Borders franchise are very promising and a clear demonstration of what can be achieved um, by a true public-private partnership. The investment that will be pumped into our rail network over the next decade um, could not be achieved um, by the public sector alone. Um, the biggest transformation will be in the southeast of Wales, with the Metro delivering better transport links for our capital city. I hope the investment, though, will deliver um, improvements for the whole of Wales. I note from the Cabinet Secretary's statement that the North East Metro is to be accelerated. Um, what about the rest of North Wales? And will we see an end to situations that we saw when the cancellation of services between Llandidno Junction and uh, Blaenau Fest in York were apparent? Uh, well, the, the, there are structural issues on the Conway Valley line, uh, given the fact that it, it, it often floods. Uh, and we've seen that over the, uh, well, not often, it has sometimes flooded uh, over the past uh, few years. And that is something for Network Rail to deal with uh, in order to avoid that in the future. And she asked, what will the rest of Wales see? Better services on every uh, railway line in Wales. More frequent services from Llandidno as well, for example. We've already mentioned the Wrexham Bidston line, a proper hourly service on the Central Wales line. Uh, more services on the Cambrian coastline. Uh, station upgrades, the introduction of Bow Street Station, uh, upgraded Machynlleth, together with the, uh, the guarantee of the future of the local sheds there. If we come down further south, an extra train on the uh, Heart of Wales line, uh, station improvements in Llanelli, in Carmarthen, more frequent services between Swansea and, uh, and Fishguard Harbour. You know, these are some examples of what will be done uh, across the whole of Wales to ensure that everybody benefits. Thank you very much. Thank you for highlighting how the whole of Wales will benefit. Um, staying with the new franchise, um, I'm glad to see the commitment to retaining onboard toilets on all existing trains, um, and I hope that they will be fully accessible. Um, there was little in the Cabinet Secretary's written statement about the accessibility of rail services other than on the South East Metro. Um, we have to put an end to the situation whereby disabled passengers have to pre-plan and pre-book their journeys. Disabled passengers have been left stranded on trains, refused to uh, travel on trains, and that's if they can get access to the trains in the first place. Um, 61 of our train stations are defined as poor for accessibility um, in that they have no staff or insufficient wheelchair access or totally unsuitable wheelchair access. So, First Minister, um, what improvements will the new franchise agreement deliver to disabled passengers in well, Wales? £15 million pounds has been allocated to improve accessibility uh, and uh, every station on the franchise network will, will be made accessible. 
Thank you for that, First Minister. Um, the new franchise um, holders, uh, TLS Amy, have indicated that half of all new trains will be assembled in Wales. Um, and I ask, will they, be, um, assemb will they be built with Welsh steel? With the Trump administration's tariffs on steel, the Port Talbot Steelworks stands to lose 10% of their business. Um, with the electrification to Swansea um, abandoned and all but abandoned with the tidal lagoon, um, if the steel sector is to get support um, in Wales, then it needs to come from Wales. So what discussions have you had um, with the franchisees about using Welsh materials in addition to a Welsh workforce in the construction of new rolling stock for the Welsh Rail Network? Um, the North East Metro and the South Wales Metro. Thank you. We'd encourage, of course, there to be as much sourcing of Welsh steel as, uh, as possible. Uh, she has also raised two other important points in terms of the steel tariffs and also the tidal lagoon. I can inform members that I have written uh, today to uh, Greg Clark and suggested to him uh, that uh, the UK Government should make an offer in terms of the contract for difference uh, to the tidal lagoon on the same terms as they made the offer to Hinkley. Uh, if, it's, if it's right for Hinkley, it's right for Swansea. Uh, and she's right to point out that electrification was promised and then uh, reneged on by the UK government. The tidal lacoon has been talked down by the Secretary of State this morning and by others. Well, uh, we have put money on the table. We have said today, treat the tidal lagoon in the same way as you treated Hinkley. We ask no more than that. Uh, and we believe it would be possible for the tidal lagoon to move ahead on that basis. We await the UK government's response with regard to that. Uh, in terms of uh, steel, there are two issues with steel. Firstly, of course, the, the tariffs that the US has uh, imposed uh, will create a situation where Welsh steel will become more expensive in the US market. What is not clear as to whether that would, that would in fact lead to a, a, a decrease in demand, given the fact that so much of the steel is not made in the US and has to be bought from outside anyway. Of, of concern as well, we don't know what the effect of that will be, but of great concern as well, is where the steel that was originally bound from, for the US market will end up. If it comes to Europe, it will create a glut of steel in Europe, the price will drop, and that will not be a benefit to, um, to our steel producers. So I have said, I was in Washington and met with, with people there at the end of last week, but it's also important that the European Union now takes uh, prompt steps within weeks, not within months, to ensure that sufficient safeguards are in place to ensure that the price of steel is supported in Europe. Rwyneth Play Cymru, Leanne Wood. Diolllawydd, how much profit are Keolis Amy expected to make out of uh, Welsh rail passengers during the next 15 years? Well, there are, of course, commercial uh, matters which uh, the leader of Plaid Cymru will be aware of. What I can say, however, uh, is that for £150 million, Keolis Amy will deliver a rail franchise for Wales and the borders below the current cost of £185 million. Uh, it's a total investment of £738 million as well on phase two of the uh, metro. Uh, and what we will see is, for the first time, a rail system that people of Wales deserve and not the cast-offs of other networks. First Minister, there's been talk of this 3% uh, cap on profits, and uh, if that is true, that is no cap at all, because according to the rail industry's own trade body, the Rail Delivery Group, the average operating profit for a rail company is 2.9%. So this means that your cap is higher than the average profit <coughs> margin for train companies. Putting that uh, aside, the Wales and the Borders franchise doesn't commercially make a profit. So the only way that any rail company makes money is through government subsidies. That means, First Minister, that you are paying profits out of our budget to the pockets of private shareholders. Secondly, the idea that you won't pay a company if it doesn't meet its targets is hardly some kind of radical socialist policy because nobody pays for work that hasn't been done. It's as simple as that. Now, page 20 of the manifesto on which you were elected promised that you would deliver a not-for-profit rail operator. You have failed. You've done the exact opposite. So can you explain... If you believe that the only way to deliver a rail service that works for people in Wales is through a not-for-profit operator, why have you lumbered us 
with a second-rate private rail service for the next 15 years. Oh, talking Wales down. Talking Wales down yet again. This is the, of all the people who have commented yesterday, the only party who have said this is a bad idea, then it's going to be a second-rate network, is Plaid Cymru, the party of Wales, apparently, who is, who is saying this. Now, you know, there are legitimate questions. I understand that in terms of the way it works. But to say this is a second-rate network is simply not true. Have a look for, uh, at what is being proposed for Wales. And bear in mind that the delivery cost is a good £30 million below the current cost. So actually, this is far better value for money than the current system with uh, Arriva. She asks the question again, you know, why was it not the case that this was set, not set up as a, not, uh, as a not-for-profit? Why is it not the case that a public sector operator is not running the service? Because the law says so. That's why she you can't do it. it. Her party the can't do it. The reality you is, she is, she is saying to the people of Wales, you know, we would have done something that actually we know legally we can't do. And that's not a particularly credible position, I would suggest. For goodness sake, let's all celebrate the fact we have an excellent rail service that's going to be set up across the whole of Wales. People will benefit, good value, new trains, air conditioned, all delivered by a Welsh Government working for the people of Wales. First Minister, a cap of 3% will see profits to Keyless Amy in the region of between 100 and £150 million from this contract. Whether you pay them now or in five years' time means that the Welsh taxpayer is putting money in the pockets of private company shareholders instead of reinvesting back in our own rail network. That's £150 million that could have been spent on better trains, on more stations, on cheaper tickets. Now, the Scotland Act 2016 contained a clause that explicitly allowed for the Scottish Government to procure a public sector rail operator. One year later... I do, I do need to hear, and I'm sure the First Minister needs to hear, the, lead, the leader of Plaid Cymru. So can, can we please allow Leanne Wood to continue? Please, please. Diolch Llywydd. One year later, there was no such clause in the Wales Act of 2017. Despite this, your government obediently voted to accept this new devolution deal from your friends in the Conservative government uh, at the UK level. Now, Plaid Cymru didn't dance to Westminster's tune. Plaid Cymru voted against that bill. First Minister, do you now regret backing the Tories by voting for the deficient Wales bill? Just over two years ago, we all sat in this chamber and watched Plaid Cymru actively canvass the support of the Tories in order for the leader of Plaid Cymru to become the First Minister. <laughs> No, I know. She says and lectures us about working with the Tories. I mean, I, memories, memories are incredibly short on the Plaid Cymru benches. If she asks me, am I happy with every element of the last Wales Act? I says no, of course I don't. There are some elements of it which I don't like. But most of it is something that I think was worth support. I don't take the absolutist view that she takes of. Let's jump off the edge of the cliff and let's see what happens. The reality is that there's more work to be done on devolution. We know that. I know that she knows that. But what we have delivered in the constraints that we have is a better value better system that the people of the valleys will support, the people of the whole of Wales will support, will but deliver a first-rate system for Wales, a first-rate railway system, the best rail system that has ever been produced for yeah. Wales, yeah. a system that will deliver the best trains, a system that will provide jobs for Newport, for a CAF, 300 jobs there, a system that will ensure that we meet our targets in terms of sustainability, in terms of job creation, in terms of economic growth. Why on earth can't Plaid Cymru just for once support something that is good for Wales? Thank you, President Officer. I find myself with a group that's stuck in the middle here, and very often uh, it, it's good to be in the middle ground of politics, I find. Uh, so I'll leave the extremists uh, debate amongst themselves on this. Uh, First Minister. What is the Welsh Government's position when it comes to a second referendum, either on the deal that's negotiated around Brexit or, the F or, or rerunning the referendum of June 2016? Uh, we don't have a position on a, a second a referendum. You want my view? Uh, I do not believe a second referendum on the issue of Brexit is merited. There's been a referendum, although you know, his party wanted a second referendum on devolution in 2005. I remember that because they thought the result was too close, but you know, I, I don't take the same view uh, in that uh, regard. 
so we don't have a position as a government. I think what's important now is to focus on getting the best deal for Wales and Britain as a result of Brexit. I did hear you correct there, First Minister, that you said you do not have a position as a government? Because obviously two of your cabinet colleagues, two of your cabinet colleagues signed a letter last week indicating that they wanted to see a referendum. Now, I always assumed that government operated on collective responsibility, and I have certainly heard you say on several occasions, as leader of the Welsh Government, you do not support a second referendum. So surely there is collective responsibility, and Cabinet colleagues now, after you've signalled that you are leaving the office of First Minister, are running their own agendas. Why is collective responsibility not running on this particular issue? I, I can't believe that he's chosen this ground to, uh, to ask questions. Let's see for example, the situation that happens in Whitehall. If you want to see a lame duck leader, have a look at Whitehall. What do we have there? We have factions briefing against each other in public. We have people like Boris Johnson openly criticising the Prime Minister over Brexit policy without any kind of penalty. He'd have been out on his feet if he'd have been in my government, I can tell you that now. We now have this farce where a decision has been taken on Heathrow, where carte blanche has been given to Cabinet Ministers to campaign against that because there's not enough support in Cabinet to take a collective decision. And when it comes to collective responsibility, we are solid here compared to the anarchist collective that exists in London. First Minister, I noticed you didn't address my question about your own government, and it was only some months ago that you sacked the member for Cardiff Central from her role as government oversight on the European Committee because she didn't agree with Cabinet responsibility as you interpreted it, because you said that her letter of appointment had collective responsibility attached to it. So you sacked one of your backbenchers, but when one of your Liberal colleagues in the Cabinet or one of your leadership contenders here decides to break ranks with collective responsibility, you do not take any action at all. Is it not the case that it is one rule for one member of the Government and another rule for backbenchers and you are a lame duck First Minister? Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> well, let's just examine that. As I, as I said, um, as I've said, I mean, I mean, he, he's, uh, he's look, you've got to admire his brass neck. You've got to admire his brass neck more than anything else, and, and his ability to ignore the chaos that his party has created in London, and the fact that cabinet government, as we know it, doesn't exist actually in in Whitehall under his party. Uh, he asked the question, "What's our view?" Our view has always been, and I've said this many, many times in the chamber, that any deal should be approved by the parliaments (plural) of the UK. That's the situation. If that doesn't happen, well, it could well be there's another election. Have to, there would have to be another election. If there is then an inclusive result, there has to be some way of settling it. But we're some way away from that. So our view as a government is quite simply this. Let the parliaments of the UK decide as to whether the final deal is a good one or not. And I come back to the, again to his point. There's a, there is a, an element of incredible double standards in the Tory party. And let me say why. You know, I don't advocate a second referendum on Brexit. I don't advocate that. Because I remember his party saying in 1997 the result of the devolution referendum is too close and there needs to be another referendum. And they stood on that manifesto commitment in a general election. And now they say, well, of course, that, that was then, this is now. Well, I, I, I don't have that double standard. I argued against the second referendum then. I argue against the second referendum now on the issue of Brexit. When he wants to lecture us, about our position, he needs to take a long, hard look at his own party and the mess which they're leaving the UK in, the complete lack of planning, the complete lack of unity and the complete lack of a government. <laughs> Question three, John Griffiths. What future strategy will the Welsh Government follow to improve community cohesion in South Wales? Well, there are four objectives uh, that we will pursue. <laughs> Firstly, building community cohesion at the national level. Secondly, cohesion support at a regional level for isolated groups. Thirdly, integration of new arrivals. And fourthly, mitigating tensions and tackling hate crime. First Minister, policing is <coughs> crucial to ensuring our communities are cohesive and enjoy good quality of life. And our police forces work with local authorities, health, housing, and indeed the voluntary sector in close partnership reflecting the fact that a large majority of police work concerns, concerns devolved responsibilities. Given that, in the very strong case for devolving policing that follows from it, what work will Welsh Government do to ensure that relevant issues are foreseen and explored in terms of future devolution of policing? Well, 
Can I thank the member for his question? Uh, he is right to say that we have a long-standing position of supporting the devolution of uh, policing, and of course the Commission uh, for, uh, on Justice will be looking at uh, further uh, issues. It is important, of course, devolution or not, that we work with the police. We do that, whether it's through the Civil Contingencies Forum, whether it's through uh, other groups such as, uh, for example, uh, looking at victim support, because we're committed to protecting and supporting victims of hate crime. So we provided funding to Victim Support Company to operate the National Hate Crime Report and Support Centre. That funding will continue till at least uh, 2020. And there do continue to be positive signs that victims are coming forward and are more confident in reporting. Mohamed Ashka. Presiding officer. First Minister, the third sector organisations play a vital role in strengthening and actively promoting community cohesion, as well as providing a link between public bodies and ethnic minorities' communities. For them to succeed, they need, to need the support of the Welsh Government. So, will the First Minister outline how his strategy to improve community cohesion will utilise and support the third sector in Wales, please? Uh, well, it, one of the things that we're looking at is whether we should update the community cohesion plan before the summer of this year to take account of recent rises in hate crime uh, and the new challenges to community cohesion in uh, Wales. Uh, I can confirm uh, that uh, we plan to publish the community cohesion plan and the tackling hate crimes delivery plan. So as those plans are taken forward, they will take account of uh, new evidence and fresh circumstances. Leanne Wood. There is definitely more that can be done on this front, First Minister, when you consider the latest figures from the Home Office show that hate crimes are up uh, by a fifth in Wales in just one year. The majority of the 2,941 offences recorded, uh, and we know that there will be many more incidents which go unreported uh, related to race or religion. And if you combine this with Nazi graffiti that has appeared in Cardiff and Newport in recent months, a worrying picture begins to emerge. We also know that Muslim women are disproportionately affected by hate crime. So can you tell us what can your government do to provide targeted support, in particular for Muslim women, but to all others who are victims of hate crime and discrimination? And how can Welsh government directly challenge uh, this growing problem of hate crime? Well, as, as I said earlier on, we do uh, fund Victim Support uh, Cymru, uh, and I, I said earlier on when that funding would continue till at least 2020. Uh, can I join with her in deploring uh, the daubing of uh, racist slogans on buildings, particularly not, but not exclusively in Newport, and I know that she will share my uh, strong condemnation uh, of that. When it comes to reporting crimes, of course, there are two ways of looking at it. Firstly, uh, if there is an increase in reported crime, it may be that the actual level of crime has increased, but also, uh, it may also be that people are more willing to come forward to report crime. It's always difficult to, to get underneath uh, statistics. Uh, from our perspective, uh, we believe that more people are coming forward, they're not enough yet to report uh, hate crime, and that's why, of course, uh, we continue to support Victim Support Cymru, uh, as, I've, uh, as I've said, uh, and also, of course, to, uh, to see how we can further uh, evaluate the community cohesion plan in order to be more effective. Question, Pimply Waters. Uh, Dioch, what plans does the First Minister have in place to support the rollout of 5G technology? Well, we've appointed Innovation Point to advise, stimulate and develop uh, activity on 5G in Wales. Uh, including opportunities to secure funding from the UK Government 5G Testbed and Trials Fund. Thank you, First Minister. 5G, as you know, will be crucial to enable much of the innovation that will come out of the fourth industrial revolution. Without 5G, things like driverless cars and the Internet of Things simply won't be possible. In China, they've already established 5G testbeds in 16 cities and predict that 5G will be commercially available in 2020. We've currently got plans for just one uh, in Monmouthshire. There's an opportunity to use the Swansea Bay City Region Metro that's being proposed as a test bed for using 5G in Wales to develop a new type uh, of metro in the West. So what is the First Minister going to do to make sure Wales isn't left behind and we commit to ensuring that 5G will be commercially available in Wales by 2020, just like in China? Well, uh, some of that is outside of our control, but he, he asked the question properly, what, what are we doing as a government? What I can say to him is that Innovation Point have been working closely with local authorities to develop uh, credible bids, and they have done that with the Swansea and Cardiff <coughs> city regions. 
The deadline is uh, is the 12th of this uh, month, but that work is ongoing, so that it's not just at Munlisha, but we look at how this can work for, for the uh, for the regional um, for, for, the, for our city regions as well. I can say as well that Innovation Point is working with a digital catapult to undertake the Wales element of a wider UK 5G mapping study. Uh, that's delivered an up-to-date, comprehensive uh, view of the emerging 5G system in Wales on both the regional and local level. So as the North is concerned, Innovation Point have also been providing support to Bangor University in their efforts to establish a digital signal processing centre of excellence in the North of our country. So, Mamisha, yes, first, but looking now, of course, at Swansea and Cardiff and beyond. David Melding. First Minister, can I uh, you know, welcome the fact that Monmouthshire will be chosen as a 5G uh, testbed. I think uh, uh, the, the implications for rural connectivity are uh, outstanding. Um, and this announcement is a clear example of the UK government delivering in terms of digital strategy for Wales. And I look forward to how you're going to cooperate with it. We've heard about the range of applications uh, and uh, these, to add to them, will go to smart farming with drones and using the internet to improve healthcare in the home, increasing manufacturing productivity, even as far as uh, self-driving uh, cars. So what consideration are you giving to the impact that 5G technology will have on the health sector and public sector in Wales, first observing the practice in Monmouthshire? Discussions are ongoing uh, between the, uh, uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary, Julie James, uh, and those in the health sector to see how 5G can benefit the health sector. As I said earlier on, we quite often see technology as something that primarily benefits the economy. It does, no question about that. But we know there are opportunities in both health and education and other sectors to make sure that technology uh, facilitates better working in the future. What measures is the Welsh Government taking to support small businesses in Monmouth? Well, through uh, Business Wales and the Development Bank, we're committed to supporting entrepreneurs, of course, and SMEs across Wales, and our focus remains uh, on innovation-driven entrepreneurs, jobs and the economy. Diocha, First Minister, can I ask you, uh, there was great concern about the introduction of the rate revaluation uh, recently, uh, last year, I should say. Uh, that revaluation uh, had a mixed effect across Wales. Uh, some areas were far better off, uh, others were, were not so good. I mean, areas like mine in Monmouthshire and also the Vale of Glamorgan, Cowbridge, were badly affected. There is one business in Chepstow uh, in my constituency that's seen its business rates rise from £4,500 per year to almost £8,000. Now, I know that were, there were packages of support that were available, but those haven't helped all businesses, particularly that business in Chepstow, which is now in very serious difficulty. Can you tell me if you're going to revisit the rate revaluation and see how you can better provide for so support for businesses that have been badly affected like this? Well, the difficulty is, if you revise uh, the revaluation or go back to the former um, valuation, you end up with, with people having to pay more as a result of the fact they pay less now. There are always people who pay more, there are always people who pay less. We've known that through revaluations over the, uh, the years. What we look to do then, of course, is to provide support for those who need it most. I don't know the, the ins and outs of the, of the uh, situation with the business that the member has, uh, has described, but what I can say is that um, during the course of this year, we'll be providing around £210 million pounds of rates relief to support businesses and other uh, ratepayers, and that means that three quarters, or more than three quarters of ratepayers in Wales uh, will see uh, a difference. Indeed, more than half will pay no rates at all. Question Scythe, Don Bowden. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on the Welsh Government's overall strategy for the funding of local government in Wales? Well, we support local government services through a mix of core revenue funding, capital funding and specific grants as appropriate. Our strategy continues to be to protect local government uh, from the impacts of austerity within the resources available to us as a government. Thank you, First Minister. And I think in these times of uh, Tory austerity, the approach that the Welsh Government has taken is to be welcomed. Um, I'm aware, of course, that for the current 2018-19 budget round, less of this money was hypothecated or ring-fenced, therefore giving greater um, uh, flexibility and discretion over local authority spending priorities. From my recent questions to the Education Secretary, you'll be aware that in Merthyr Tydfil County Borough Council, this means that school funding is being cut and breakfast clubs are under threat, which is actually contrary to the Council's own budget consultation in which the public said that schools and education were their number one priority for the borough. So do you agree with me that this must draw into question whether the Welsh Government can risk removing ring-fenced funding from any further priority areas, such as uh, supporting people, for example, if some local authorities are going to choose to cut in your determined priority areas? 
Well, well the member makes a fair point. Uh, we look, of course, to give as much flexibility as possible to uh, local authorities, and they are answerable to their electorates for the decisions that they, that they take. Uh, I would have hoped that any local authority would see education as a, as a very strong priority. Uh, I'm surprised to hear what the member has said about her own uh, uh, local uh, authority. Uh, and it is the case that local authorities need to demonstrate that as they are given greater flexibility, that they continue to prioritise spending in those areas where money is needed most. And education is one of those areas. Jonathan Salt. Reforming local government, power to local people, white paper, acknowledged directly that there is a need, First Minister, for a more fundamental review of the funding of local government. The current Green Paper also notes that local authorities have highlighted a number of additions in relation to funding. Reacting to the Green Paper, the WLGA states that it would continue to press the case for proper funding of authorities, and a number of our local authorities now remain committed to calling for appropriate and equitable longer-term uh, funding budgets. Vale of Glamorgan note that there is a well-made case for changes to the formula, as do many other local authorities. Now, when one considers the cons correspondence your Cabinet Secretary has received, but yet he ignores, and he isn't listening now, he's actually preferring to completely ignore the question, and he is the Cabinet Secretary for Local Government. Mm. So, as well as ignoring those calls and ignoring this question today, yeah, will, you liaise, will you liaise and talk to your Cabinet Secretary, please, to ensure that there is a more sustainable funding model and formula uh, to be established going forward. It's the very least that our local authorities deserve. Well, I think the Vale Morgan need to explain why they spend less on education than anywhere else in Wales uh, per head. That is under her party, uh, and that is something that they will need to explain to their uh, electorate. So what I can say to her is, is this, that we fund local authorities at a level far higher than would be the case if they were in uh, England. We have sought to uh, protect them as much as we uh, can. Uh, but it's uh, inevitable uh, that there will be difficulties and a squeeze on local authorities because we are ourselves being squeezed. Can I suggest that she takes up the issue with her party in London who continue to impose a squeeze year after year after year after year on uh, Welsh Government, on the Welsh budget, while at the same time chucking a billion pounds towards Northern Ireland by a handful of votes. Uh, that is how low the current UK Government have got. No strategy, all about buying votes. In a brief that Leon had thought I'd see Tras rang any the week I thought I'd lay all and the father can eat it and a papier quid that he rang any sicker high can let do ye that yan all a can horror ear the bottle. Marwin wear can horror let let can re a bob, he will glitter the doll and question in grieve ava the in or can horror earn our bed arian. Vesher sail honey, pa assessiat arianol, mar swatraith wedi gubble high, er moin kevnoki buriat ar papir gwyrdd, vaint an inion, a dachin gobithioi arbet, adros pa governor do amser, a beth with cost kachunol, with retir isles druthirama. Well, man, Agost, it's not them in the system or the law of the law. I mean, it's a good thing about the law. And I'm going to ask you 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 to ask Bod awr yr lleol yn gweithio gyda'i gilydd mewn ffordd rhan barhol. Dwi ddim yn ddigon da i awr yr lleol i weud, wel, dwi ddim yn gweithio gyda rhynasydd i ddyn ni. Dwi ddim yn gweld gwrs y gwaniaeth maro sy'n gael ei wneud yn addysg gyda'r consortia. Dwi ddim yn un awr yr lleol yn Nghymru gallu gweithredu yn iawn dros y bod sydd yn byw o ti fewn i ddi ffiniau, os nid gyn nhw'n gweithio gyda awr yr lleol yn eraill. So, mae arian yn bwysig yn gyda'n diall hwnna, ond mae'n modd mae bod yn gweithio yn bwysig hefyd. What action is the Welsh Government taking to protect and support the steel industry in Wales? Well, we remain fully committed to supporting steel making in Wales and to, secure, uh, to ensure a secure and sustainable uh, future for the, uh, the sector. We're working hard, of course, with uh, Tata. If I could read to the uh, member the joint statement that we sent out next, last week with Tata Steel, which says we're working closely and constructively together to finalise the substantial public investment in the power plant at Portalba, which will reduce energy costs and cut carbon emissions. We remain fully committed to a secure and sustainable future for steelmaking at Port Talbot, and this investment will play a significant part in this. We look forward to announcing the final go-ahead for the project and drawdown of funding in the near future. That builds on, of course, the substantial help that we've given to uh, steelmaking in Wales, and rightly so, because we know how important steelmaking is to our economy. 
Thank you, First Minister, for that answer and preempting my question in it, to an extent. But the sanctions being imposed by the US, clearly on UK steel, is going to have a major impact upon Portalba steel and steel products from elsewhere in Wales. Now, steel companies will look for elsewhere other markets that you already highlighted to sell their steel, and therefore the price of steel is likely to go down. This affects the profitability of steel. Therefore, we need to address these matters. And you've already thankfully commented upon the leaked report that was mentioned in the press a couple of weeks ago about the £30 million investment in Tata for the power plant. So I can leave that one. But you also, in your response to Carlene Jones, mentioned the actions that need to be taken to address the steel tariff issues. What are you doing as a government to actually push those? Because it's important that we get this message across to the UK government and elsewhere to ensure that actions are taken to protect our steel industry and the profitability of our steel industry, otherwise we will see damage done to our industry here. Yeah. Can I thank the member for his uh, question and the many questions he's asked on behalf of his constituents, and rightly so. Uh, he asks uh, what, what I have done. I was in Washington uh, last week. Uh, I had several meetings there, including meetings with British Embassy uh, staff. Uh, we worked through uh, what needed to be done next. It's not clear because the US government can be unpredictable, if I can put it uh, that way. Uh, it's been made clear many, many times to the US that actually steel from <laughs> Wales, steel from the UK, does not pose a threat to the American steel uh, industry. Many of the products that we export to the States are, are not made in the States. All that will happen is the price will go up for the American uh, uh, consumer. What we are not clear about uh, is what effect there will be in terms of tariffs. I know in Trostra, for example, uh, that uh, exports to the US are a very profitable part of that uh, business, and it's not clear, actually, whether Trostra will still be able to continue to sell to the US, if only for the fact the US doesn't produce uh, what Trostra uh, produces. But as I said earlier on, what's hugely important is we don't see steel that was previously bound for the, the US market ending up in the European market, causing a drop in the price of steel. That inevitably uh, would not help in terms of the long-term sustainability of our industry. Susie Davis. Uh, deal, uh, yes, First Minister, I think when it comes to the, uh, the threat of the uh, US tariffs, all, all UK governments need to be working together and, uh, and speaking with one voice on this and actually uh, improving efforts, not least in getting these city deal monies flowing, because obviously part of that uh, for the, South Wales, uh, the East Swansea Bay city deal is the Steel Innovation Centre. Um, I, I take some reassurance from your comments on the power station. I think we were all slightly confused by the comment that the decision would not be made on that until after you'd left as First Minister. So perhaps you can reassure us that, it, they, that uh, this money from last year's budget will be released as soon as possible. Um, if you can give us a date for that, uh, rather than we are working together, I think uh, all Tata workers would be far more reassured. Uh, nothing is on hold uh, while I am First Minister, as, as the member can well imagine. I am very keen to uh, take decisions that help uh, the people of Wales uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, and uh, that is something that we intend to do uh, once we're in a position to do so with regard to Batalbert. We ask the judges what we've already done, the money that we, we've committed, the, the close working uh, that we have had as a government uh, with Tata, not just in the UK, but also in Mumbai uh, as well. Uh, and she will have heard the joint statement that I, uh, I read out in the chamber that was uh, made by both ourselves as a government and by Tata. Bethan Syed. Yes, well, it was on the power plant that I wanted to ask further because, of course, um, I met with Tata and they said that they've obviously completed phase one, but they've got four, three other stages to complete with regards to uh, the replacement of the power plant. And we're talking here about uh, US a steel tariff. Surely investment now is critical uh, in uh, the power plant in Botolbert to ensure that we mitigate against any worst effects um, coming from uh, those tariffs. So I understand from their briefing that the heads of terms uh, for the grant funding has not yet uh, been agreed uh, between you. Can you give us assurances uh, that you will um, make that decision as soon as possible um, and that you will give us clear, uh, a clear outline as to when that decision will be made so that progress can be put forward uh, in Port Talbot um, on this particular scheme? So, yes, of course, we want to take the decision as quickly as, uh, as possible. Tata understand that uh, as well, and she will have heard uh, what was said as part of the joint statement that was issued between ourselves and uh, Tata. No uh, looking forward, of course, to the, uh, the announcement when that can be uh, done and the drawing down of funding. Tata know uh, that they have experienced a level of support, both financially and morally, from the, uh, the Welsh Government. The situation is one of trust, and we want to make sure, of course, that we can make this announcement as quickly as possible.